Could you say a little bit more about this idea of neural diversity and how it relates to Neanderthals? We have in our own population a variety of individuals who cover a spectrum of neurodiversity, meaning that the high-functioning autistics, dyslexic, even bipolar have been major world leaders and thought leaders despite or possibly because of their neural diversity. My idea from before we had Neanderthal genetic was that it was likely that we would get genes from Neanderthals just as a function of them being relatively closely related to us and the possibility of interbreeding happening. The Neanderthal has left traces in the genome of modern humans. And it turns out that we did get something from Neanderthals. Several areas related to mental development, for example, mutations which lead to autism. We might find additional highly optimal. These are, these are not like these are mutants. So we see that the autistics are not only intact, but they happen to be superior. Some of the ways in which autistics are superior to normal uh, people would be useful for science. They're perceptual experts. They're perceptual experts. And the face is also stuck forward really far relative to the brain case. When comparing boys with autism to typically developing boys, she found significant differences in face shape. They have a broader mouth. The divot above the upper lip seems to be broader, as well as sort of the mid-face region. The brains of children with autism are actually larger. The brain development of modern human babies differ significantly from that of the Neanderthals. Neanderthals did have bigger brains than us. Neanderthal skull just goes back and back on the occipital cortex, the part related to vision. And I used to joke around about having a gigantic internet trunk line going deep into my visual cortex. Neanderthal being attracted by symmetry. It appears that they were made by Neanderthal. Neanderthal, as opposed to Homo sapiens. We didn't think that Neanderthal made art, but this is also 10,000 years older than the other oldest pieces of art we knew about. Since he was a toddler, Dane has been able to draw with extraordinary precision. When he was 11, he drew a perfect aerial view of London after only one helicopter ride. This implies that they probably had some pretty sophisticated boats. Different populations of people, for example, European and Chinese people, have different Neanderthal genes. There are a number of things that I have that came from Neanderthal. One of the things is a part of the androgen receptor increases the likelihood of baldness. Published this year, the androgen receptor gene associated with autism. There's a psychologist at Cambridge. He writes of the male mind and the female mind. Children with autism show faster brain development. And when you actually compare different parts of the brain, some structures fit this extreme male pattern. And at first, the only language that I had for it was gender. But then I started to notice that some men had these traits and some women did not at all. That's when I realized it was actually introversion and extroversion and that there was no language for talking about questions of identity. More autistic children are born to MIT graduates. There's more autism here in Silicon Valley. The sort of nasty conclusion is that too much mathematical ability is bad for your children. There's creatures on Earth who reached a very high level of social organization. Yeah, like that be us. That's us. And the uh, social insects. Right. That be ants. Ants, like humans, can have things like mass transit emerge, self-reliance declines, more division of labor occurs. Through their work with diverse ant species, Abu Haif and his team reveal that traits can lay dormant and be induced by exposing larvae to an overdose of a naturally occurring hormone. Simon Baron Cohen has pretty good data that it's the fetal testosterone. Testosterone seems to have organizational effects on brain development. Phenotypes that get induced in populations that reflect these kind of ancestral traits. They're usually called atavism. Previously, evolutionary biologists had treated them as sort of the Barnum and Bailey of evolution or some kind of slips of a developmental system. And what we're showing here is that no, the fact that we can induce it reflects some deep underlying potential that goes back to the ancestor. So the ancestor must have had this trait. It lost the expression of the trait, but it retained this genetic potential. When a queen lays an egg, if it receives the right temperature cues, it becomes a queen. If not, that egg develops into a worker. If it gets the proper nutrition, it develops into a soldier. And these switches during development are governed by a hormone called juvenile hormone. In humans, as well as other animals, the hormone does its work by binding to androgen receptors, which are all over the body, but are also found in the brain. Parts of the motor system are committed to social behavior. They are mirroring your behavior. Autism may have something to do with mirror neurons. In fact, in our hominid ancestry, males and females occupied very different niches with females taking much more of a social role and with males having a much more of a solitary role. There would be very little point in having a mirror system if you lived on your own. There would be a lot of point in having a digestive system, having a movement system, having a visual system if you lived on your own. But there'd be no point in having a mirror system. How do you determine who does it and who doesn't do it? 
That's the accidents of evolutionary history. There's another type of evolution where two organisms come together to make one. It's a process called introgression. We have more than a dozen Neanderthals from whom we've got complete mitochondrial DNA sequences. But because mitochondria replicate themselves in a separate fashion, it doesn't get mixed with the DNA of the father. It's just the mother's mitochondrial DNA. Their mitochondrial sequences are all distinct from ours. Because after all, when two groups meet each other and there's some social inequality, one almost always mixes, but the offspring will generally stay with one or the other group. This is a rapidly evolving field. It also seems to be why a number of hybrid crosses, for example, between a horse and a donkey, give rise to a mule that is sterile because of the incompatibility of the mitochondria with the nuclear DNA. The mitochondrial DNA must itself have been affected in its evolution by its function. In the first committed steps of innate immunity. The Neanderthals had particular gene variants that play a big role in immune defense. It looked as though there were alleles that came into the modern human population. The downside was that it gave a greater risk of not being able to control the response to infection leading to, to autoimmunity. He says that could explain the increasing prevalence of diseases like lupus, celiac disease. Children with mothers who had celiac disease were nearly three times as likely to be diagnosed with autism. And children with mothers who had rheumatoid arthritis were also at a 70% increased risk for autism. And so we're now we're having to readapt to this changing environment. Well, this architecture creates problems for our genome. We and many other people are onto something by looking at these copy number variants. Copy number difference between the Neanderthal and the reference human genome sequence. They're going to be in these parts of the genome that used to be called junk DNA. We have the genes that once enabled our ancestors to have a, as good a sense of smell as dogs. But the genes have mostly been turned off. Isn't that uh, they, the premise of X-Men? It was analyzed as Tourette's and Asperger's, uh, which I still have a little bit today. In hunter-gatherers, they don't have bosses. When somebody tries to be a boss, they make merciless fun of you. When the little boy said the emperor is naked, he wasn't telling anyone anything that they didn't already know. He was nonetheless changing the state of their knowledge. Everyone now knew that everyone else knew that everyone else knew. And that gave them the collective power to challenge the dominance of the emperor uh, through their, their uh, laughter. Kids with autism do pretty much only one kind of laugh. Like in our conversation right now, I, if I say something dumb, you might kind of... And you don't really feel good inside, but you've learned to sort of grease the social wheels in this context. Kids with autism, I don't think that they're probably picking up on those subtle social cues. They're genuine, so they just laugh when they feel good. Kids are producing these sounds that may actually influence others positively. Simpler forms of empathy may predate human beings, which should come as no surprise. Empathy is the mortar that holds society together. More than half a billion years ago, a new material appeared on Earth. Clumps of cells that adhered to each other, sometimes acting like a liquid and other times like a solid. The physical properties of this new substance set the stage for the physical forms of multicellular organisms. I spoke with Stuart Newman about how the properties and forces inherent in this material still hold sway in patterns of animal development. I call these different forms and structures morphological motifs, and not every one of them is present in every type of animal, but there's a limited number of them, and every type of animal is organized with at least several of these motifs. What are some ideas about how these shared motifs might have arisen from our single-celled ancestors? There was several billion years of evolution that led to the single-celled ancestors of the animals. So these cells were quite sophisticated and adapted to their own single-cell life. Then something happened that allowed cells to cluster. Single cells can do just fine on glycolysis. They don't need mitochondria for energy production. Really, you need mitochondria when you start putting multiple cells together to make animals and plants. We're different. We have mitochondria. We learned a trick. We didn't learn it. We stole it from the prokaryotes, how to breathe oxygen, 10 times more energy out of the foods that we eat. But they existed as their own bacterial cell. And one day, one of these things ended up inside of an animal cell, probably because the animal cell was trying to eat it. But instead of eating it, it realized that this thing was really super smart and good at turning food into energy, and it just kept it. It stayed around. And to this day, they sort of act like their own separate organisms, like they do their own thing within the cell. This is done time and time again in evolution. It's not studied. The reason is, it's very complex. 
the genes that mediate clustering of cells in all of the modern animals. They're called cadherins. They existed in these single-celled organisms, and they were used for single-cell functions, for perhaps capturing prey, but they weren't used to coordinate multicellular development because there were no multicellular organisms. With the Cambrian explosion, that's when the real hidden value of mitochondria became apparent. And then you had a form of matter that previously didn't exist in the biological world <laughs> because you have these subunits that are independently mobile, but they are also cohesive. So in a sense, this new type of material is like a liquid because a liquid is defined by subunits, molecules in the case of non-living liquids that are mobile but nonetheless cohesive. The ants move over each other like the flow of a viscous liquid. Single ants crawl along the surface, but in a large group, those close to the solid surface remain stationary and mimic the way fluids behave. Natural selection really is acting at two levels. The level of the individuals competing with one another within a society and at the level of group versus group. If you have a cluster of cells, the basis of a clustering is adhesion. You can get separation into different layers because of differential adhesion, but you can also get cells kind of tugging from the inside and pulling away from each other, and that complicates things. In a non-living liquid, nothing is tugging from inside the molecule to pull the individual molecules away from each other. So this is basically a unique characteristic of the kinds of liquid-like materials that a cluster of cells represents because it has this internal tugging that can change the balance of forces. There is this tension. On the one hand, you want to belong. You want to be a part of the tribe. You want to be enclosed in a community and feel all the, the fellowship of being connected. And another part of one wants to stand alone and be an individual who is utterly different from everyone else. They're the tribe. And it's that pull, that spark of electricity, that I think gives an enormous creative tension. Everybody has a talent to interact with other people short of being on the autistic spectrum, which is something that many people are in, in very small ways or in, in greater ways. But even that can be helped by the interactions of the internet. People aren't the first creatures to use the internet. Ants have apparently had their own version for a very long time. So the amount of information flowing through the colony, the communications, there can be teams and assembly lines, things like mass transit, even features of the market economy. Humans were quite consistent with the rule of reaching new sociality in advanced society, quite consistent with all the rest of the animal kingdom and of course we were different in that we developed culture along the way. 